This audio presentation is provided by nativecatholic.com. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the biblical basis uh, for purgatory. And there's a couple of important things to discuss before we get into that. But before we even do that, I think it's an important question to address, is why do we study like this? Why is it important to know how to defend what we believe, how to explain what we believe? And there's a couple of passages I want to share with you guys, if you guys want to turn with me or at least write them down. Um, the first I want to share with you is... 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Again, this is not directly related to purgatory yet, but this is giving a reason why we're doing what we're doing. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And if you look at it, it very simply says, this is good, starting from verse 3 actually, this is good and it is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God desires that all men know truth. And that's important, that God desires that. Next turn to, and you can write it down if you guys uh, want to take notes instead of flip pages, but John chapter 8, verse 32. And John chapter 8, verse 32 is where we actually learn something very important about truth. Not only that God desires that all men know truth, but as it says here in verse uh, 32 of chapter 8. If you continue in my word and you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we know that the truth sets us free, and we know that God desires all men to be saved. There's also one more place in, in John that I think is really important. That's chapter 18, verse 37. And if you look at John 18, 37, there's something else that we learn. It says here, For this I was born... And for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And this is really important, because when it comes to explaining our faith or doing Bible study, a lot of times we run into people who just say something like this. Well, why do we have to know all this stuff? Why can't we just love? Why can't we just be a light to others and just love them, show God's love? Absolutely, that's really important. But as it says here in chapter 18, that... God didn't just come, Jesus did not just come here just to love everyone, but to deliver truth. And that really what he's trying to say is that his truth is love. And so when we share truth with others, what are we doing? We are showing them God's love. And that's really, really important for us to know as we study. And then also one last thing, 1 Peter chapter 3. This is a big one for all of us here. I think we've gone over it before. But 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And this is where we get the word apologetics from the Greek word apologia. And an apologia is not like the modern sense of apology. We're not saying sorry for our faith. But apologia is what a defense attorney does. It's a case. It's a defense, a formal defense of something. So if we ever need an attorney, they'd be creating an apologia for us, an apology for us to defend our, our side. Same thing that St. Peter's calling us to do here is whatever it is that we believe as Catholics, it's important for us to seek understanding. We're not going to know everything. Trust me, even preparing for this, I was like, holy smokes, there's so much more that I don't know. I can't possibly cover half of it because I don't know half of it. But... We seek knowledge of these things. As John Paul II's letter, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. We seek knowledge of why we believe what we believe. And when we have that knowledge, we're called to share it and to deliver that truth to those who ask of it. Now, this is what it does not say. Because it says with gentleness and reverence, it's important. God is not calling us to go out and to start throwing Bibles at people and be like, Yo, listen to me, I'm Catholic, you need to be Catholic, do it now. Guys, you know how easy it is to be an apologist or an evangelist for the Catholic faith? All you have to do is go out and tell people you're Catholic. And they're going to come to you. Because so many people misunderstand the faith. 
and think bad things about the faith, that they're going to come and test you and challenge you. Every single time someone challenges you, look at it as an opportunity to share the truth. The truth that sets people free. And if you're ever afraid, remember this, Luke chapter 5 verse 10. Luke 5.10, what does it say here? I'm going to read it accurately. Luke 5.10 here. Do not be afraid. Henceforth you will be catching men. And so Jesus himself is telling us not to be afraid. When we go out and we share the truth, are we going to mess up? Absolutely. But even in that mess up, if we do it with gentleness and reverence out of love for God and His church and out of a desire to help others see the truth, I promise you God's going to grant grace in that situation. Even if you do it wrong but you're trying your best, God's going to grant grace in that situation. I truly believe that. So this is why we're doing what we're doing in order to understand our faith. And this is why we're going to study uh, purgatory today. Does anybody have questions yet, though? What we're going to do is, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of things about purgatory, take a break, do questions, and then keep going. I know it's usually conversational, but for tonight, we're recording it, so I'm going to kind of do one thing, questions, and another thing, yeah? Questions. I know that um, for the church on earth, we're called the church militant, the church in heaven. Church triumphant in purgatory? What is it called? Well, there's two possible words. It's either church purgatant or church suffering. All right. Any other questions about that? Now, why purgatory? Why are we talking about purgatory tonight? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because it's one of the most misunderstood precepts of our faith, not only by non-Catholics, but by Catholics. Many Catholics don't quite understand what purgatory is all about. There's a couple of things we need to know. First of all, purgatory is a de fide article of faith. Purgatory is real. It's not an option. It's not something where we can choose to believe if we want. It is real. And I'm sorry if you have people out there even that call themselves theologians that say that purgatory is a myth. Even supposed Catholic theologians that say purgatory is a myth. They're the same people that are trying to push for things such as female ordination. Right? Same people who are trying to push for things such as releasing the supposed ban on contraception. Right? These are called dissenters. And every time somebody brings this up and says, well, I don't believe in that purgatory stuff anymore, the one thing I challenge in love and respect and gentleness and reverence, as St. Peter tells us to do, I always tell them, you know, make sure that the next time you say the Nicene Creed that you mean it when you say that I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Because when you say that, you're saying that you believe everything the church professes. When you receive communion, you also profess that you believe everything the church teaches. It doesn't mean you can't question it. It doesn't mean you can't struggle understanding it. But you need to give it a sense of the will. That's what's really important. And so purgatory is an article of faith. And why don't we write this down? Let's start off here. I know not everyone has your catechisms, but it's very clear in catechism paragraphs 1030 and 1031 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I'll actually go ahead and, and read that out loud right now. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of scripture, speaking, speaks of a cleansing fire. Quote, As for certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. He who is truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor the age to come. From this sentence, we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age, but certain others in the age to come. And we're going to go over that verse where that comes from. But there are a couple of things here. Now, people think that the Catholic Church has some elaborate theology on purgatory. And trust me, there's books written on it. You can go deep into understanding it. However, 
there's only three essential components. If you want to write these down, these are the three essential components, meaning outside of these components, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, smart theological assumption, but there's only three essential precepts that are essential for us to know about purgatory, according to the church. Number one, that a purification after death does exist. A purification after death does exist. Two, two, we know that it involves some kind of pain or suffering. The kind of pain or suffering is not specifically defined, but we know that there is some kind of pain or suffering as we are being refined by the fire, so to speak. And then, the la lastly, we know that the purification of our souls and the souls of those of purgatory can be assisted by the prayers and offerings of those who are on earth, from the church pilgrim, from the church here on earth. We can pray for those in purgatory and assist in their purification. Now, other than that, there's a lot of things that are not clear. We know that purgatory exists. It is a state of it. It, it, it is a, a state that exists. It might be a state of being. It might be an actual literal place. We also don't know how much time it takes, or if it takes time really at all. Could it be instantaneous? Sure, it could be. We don't know. The church fathers were kind of silent in many places about how long it takes. Or even when they, when they made a guess, they clarified by saying, by the way, this is just a guess. So we don't know how much time it takes, or when we say exists, what that exactly means, whether it be an actual place or a state of being. But those three things are sure. There is a final purification. We know it involves pain. And we know that the purification can be assisted by others. Interestingly enough, as a side, you can write this down for later, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Very important verse because it talks about suffering and it talks about how suffering can actually purify our souls. So there is an aspect of what happens in purgatory that can happen here on earth. When we suffer and we add it or join it, sorry, to the cross of Christ, when we join it to Him and we suffer for Him, through Him, and in Him, with Him, we actually purify our souls here on earth too. And that's from 1 Peter chapter 4, 4 verse 1. All right. Now, a couple of things about purgatory. This is not a teaching that was just made up. It's not something that just came up recently. It's been taught uh, since the beginning of the church. And in fact, even in the Old Testament, we see it. Uh, one of the verses we'll go over, you can write it down now if you want, is 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 41 through 45. 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 41 through 45. And we see in that verse very clearly where it talks about praying for the dead, right? It talks about praying for the dead, uh, prayers for the dead. We also know that uh, Orthodox Jews, as well as I believe the Muslims, actually do believe in some form of purification after death. And in fact, the Orthodox Jews, uh, when someone dies that's close to them, they have this prayer called the mourner's Kaddish. And it's actually a prayer for the purification of that person's soul. Yeah? So this is not something that's brand new, it's old. And I have three uh, thir church documents, early, early church documents or church fathers that, that I have written here. There are dozens, but I'm going to give you three. In 160 AD, in 160 AD, there was a book that was not inspired, it's not, it's not scripture, uh, and it might even be a novel of sorts, but still, it was an early Christian writing called The Acts of Paul and Thecla, T-H-E-C-L-A. T-H-E-C-L-A. The Acts of Paul and Thecla. And this is what it says. I have just a quote from here. And after the exhibition, Tyrana again received her, Thecla, for her daughter. Falconilla had died and said to her in a dream, Mother, you shall have the stranger Thecla in my place in order that she may pray concerning me that I may be transferred to the place of the righteous. Okay? So we have this sense of someone who's passed away 
saying, this person is going to pray for me so I can leave this place and go to the place of the righteous. Right? The word purgatory is not used, but the idea is that in 160 AD, there was Christians talking about this concept already. In other words, it wasn't made in the 1800s, like some people want to try to make up to believe. Cyril of Jerusalem, in 350, quote, Then we make mention also of those who have already fallen asleep. First, the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, that through their prayers and supplications, God will re receive our petition. Next, we make ma mention also of the holy fathers and bishops who have already fallen asleep. And, to put it simply, of all among us who have already fallen asleep. For we believe that it will be of very great benefit to the souls of those for whom the petition is carried up, while this holy and most solemn sacrifice is laid out. So when they talk about the sacrifice, I believe he's talking about the Mass. Um, I can't be sure about that, but nevertheless, he's talking about saying prayers for those who have fallen asleep, right? Because it's going to be good for them. Well, if they're, not, if they're in heaven, they don't need prayers. Agreed? If they're in hell, there's no chance of their salvation. They're in hell. So there's some place else. And then one last one is St. John Chrysostom. This is in 392. Let us help and commemorate them. If Job's son, sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our sufferings for the dead bring them some consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to offer our prayers for them. So 392, very early church. He, and in one of his lectures, this is homilies on 1 Corinthians, St. John Chrysostom is talking about praying for those who have died. Right? Again, with the understanding that those in heaven don't need it, those in hell cannot benefit from it, then there are some place else. Right? We're going to talk about some of those places in the Bible a little bit later um, as we go through it. What I want to do now, though, is this. Those verses that I posted last night, I want to go through them to give you a biblical basis for purgatory. Because one of the things that people say often is, well, okay, fine, you believe it, whatever. But it can't be supported by Scripture. Well, of course, as Catholics, we know that God's revelation came to us through two modes. Scripture and sacred tradition. So we don't need to prove it from Scripture. We don't. However, in our effort to bring truth to others, it's important that we try to understand, explain it using Scripture. Because that's how we're going to reach others. Not to mention, I believe firmly that the Catholic tradition is the easiest Christian tradition to defend using the Bible. I find it hard. Uh, I, I can't understand how some other Christian faiths, other Protestant faiths, try to defend some of their uh, doctrines, such as uh, salvation by faith alone. It's just not scriptural, right? Things as such. I think it's harder to defend that than it is to defend even some of the more unique teachings of the Catholic faith. And so, I believe that purgatory is very clearly taught in Scripture, and I want to give you about six verses that can give you a real baseline for explaining it. Then after that, we'll go through maybe another dozen verses that kind of ratify and kind of support that. So, there's a couple principles we have to know. This is really important. And then I'm going to summarize all of them so that we can kind of see how they all fit together. First of all, let's turn to 2 Samuel, <clears throat> chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 through 18. And I'll read it out loud. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went into his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. Now, what principle can we get from this? 
There's a very powerful, very almost shocking principle to learn from it. But what is true is we can be forgiven for sins, but still have what's called temporal punishment that's owed for the sin that we committed. Let me give you an example that you guys can relate to. Let's say when you're a small kid or when you got, first got your car and you crash your mom and dad's car and you come home and you're in tears and you break down before them and you're like, I'm really sorry and everything. And what does your mom and dad do? They give you a hug and say, it's okay, we love you, you're forgiven, but you're still grounded. That makes sense? Is even though they love us and still forgive us, we still have something that is owed to them, some way to make up for it. If, if my daughter, for example, throws a ball and it breaks a window, um, I'm going to love her. I'm not going to cast her out of the home. I mean, she's my daughter. I forgive her. I love her. But she's going to help me clean it up. She's going to help make up for it somehow. It's a temporal punishment. And God does the same with us. Is, and as is apparent here in Second Samuel, is that even though a sin is forgiven, and it's completely, as he says here, you shall not die. He's been forgiven of his sin. There's still a temporal punishment that was allocated for what he had done. And how do we know that uh, this sort of thing actually still happens then, you know, in the New Testament? Well, let me just give you one here that you guys can look at. Look at, well, you can write it down. I'll read it out loud if you don't want to turn there. But 1 Peter chapter 4, I believe it's verse 8. And I, I read this yesterday. It was really surprising when I read it. It says, Above all, hold unfailing your love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Wait a minute. If Christ's death on the cross was all we needed and it was just completely done, we're not only forgiven of the sins, but all punishment is taken away, why would we need something to cover a multitude of sins? It's because just like our parents would expect us to owe or to make up for what we've done, even though we are forgiven and we still inherit whatever assurance, confidence that we have of salvation, once we make amends with Christ, we still need to satisfy or make up for what we've done. All right? This is where penance comes in. You guys understand that. This is why we do penance. And so that's the principle that we get from Second Samuel chapter 12. The next principle, principle number two. By the way, I want to give, I want to give credit to where credit's due. A lot of my insight comes from two folks, John, Mar John Martinoni and John Salza. They both have websites. One's BibleChristianSociety.com and the other one is ScriptureCatholic.com. I can give you guys those later. But the second principle here is found in Revelation 21.27. If you guys want to turn to the end there, Revelation 21.27. towards the back. It is indeed the last book. Hey, let nobody, let no one tease Catholics as they try to learn how to use their Bible because Catholics hear so much scripture. 85% of the Mass is scripture. Yes, we need to get our fingers used to turning through these pages, but um, it doesn't mean that we haven't heard the scriptures. Revelation 21, 27. It's real simple. But nothing unclean shall enter it. What is it? Heaven, right? So nothing unclean shall enter heaven, which is what um, is being said here. Nothing unclean shall enter heaven. That's principle number two. Nothing with the stain of sin can enter heaven. We can't have sin on us. We can't have even the stain of sin on us to enter heaven. This is backed up by one more very powerful verse, and that is Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. If you guys want to look that up. And I'll read it once I get there. Matthew 5, 40, uh, 38 says something very, uh, 48, sorry, says very clearly, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I'll give you guys time to turn there. To write your notes down. And so it's clear that the second principle by these two verses is that nothing unclean shall enter heaven. So first of all, we know that there is temporal punishment even if we've been forgiven. And that nothing unclean can enter heaven. Because we must be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Everybody follow so far? Alright. The next one 
Let's go ahead and turn for our next principle to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'll give you time to get there. Hebrews is towards the back. It's uh, after Timothy, Titus, Philemon. It's before James. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're looking at verses 22 and 23. And I know some of you know this verse because it's in a song that we sing at church sometimes. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to a judge who is God of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's the part I want you to underline. Highlight. The spirits of just men made perfect. Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 23. And it's that last part of verse 23. Spirits of just men made perfect. And this gives us the foundation of uh, our third principle. You see, in this, in this verse, the spirits of just men who died in godliness are made perfect. It doesn't say that they arrive perfect. They are made perfect. That means they are made perfect after their death. They are made perfect after their death. But those in heaven are already perfect. We know that. Those in hell can no longer be made perfect. That means after death, there must be some process... There must be some process after death by which just the spirit of just men can be made perfect. We know it's not in heaven. We know it's not in hell. So there is a process by which the spirits of just men are made perfect. That's number three. And then number four, principle number four is going to be based upon 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. By the way, this is actually still part of principle number 3. The idea that there is some process, some place, some process by which the spirits of just men are made perfect. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Write that down, start, because guys, this is a packed verse. And in fact, after I'm done, I only have a few more verses here. After I'm done with this and we summarize things, I want to go back and visit this verse because I think this is the most clear almost proof text that purgatory exists, that St. Paul knew purgatory existed, and that St. Paul believed in it and practiced uh, the teaching of it. Again, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15. <coughs> Are we there? All right. So let's give this a read. I'm actually going to start in verse 12, um, just to give it some context. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he will be saved, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. A couple things to point out here. First of all, back in verse 13, that word day, that word day, very clearly, that word day is referring to, as it does everywhere else, that's why some, some of your Bibles might actually have a, uh, an actual uh, you know, highlight or it might be capitalized. 
Because the word day there refers to the judgment day. Or the last day. Right? So, we know that this is after death. We know that this is after death, not during your life. So, it's going to be tested. Each man's work will become tested or uh, manifest on this day. All right? And it says that if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. So, what do we get? This is back to principle number three. This very clearly shows that there is a place where, after the person dies, because it's on the last day, after the person dies, there's a place where they can suffer loss, but still be saved as through fire. Well, we're not going to suffer loss in heaven. There's no loss in heaven. There's no way for us to be saved if we're in hell. So this is a different place. This is a different place wherein we are uh, being purified or we're going to suffer loss. By the way, that word suffer uh, in the Greek also can mean punishment. right? So we receive, so we, we, we suffer loss or we're punished though we may be saved. All right? And we're going to go through this a little bit more in detail. But needless to say that that supports our principle number three, that there is a place where we are um, being suffering loss or being punished, be, being made perfect, being purified. There is a place that exists that this happen, in, in which this happens, that happens after death. All right? Let's move on here. We have a couple of more. Let's take a look at Matthew 12, 32. Matthew 12, 32. And this one's really big too because this is the verse that was cross-referenced in the catechism quote in paragraphs 1030 and 1031. This is the verse that they're quoting when they, when they read it. So that's Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. I'll wait a second until everyone's there. And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Either in this age or the age to come. So the Catholic Church in the Catechism interprets it like this. This verse implies that people can be forgiven in this age, but that there is an age to come another age after death in which people can be forgiven. If you're in heaven, there's no need for forgiveness. There is no forgiveness for those who are in hell. So this place must be somewhere else. Now, unlike the other scripture passages where I'm doing my best to use context to help explain what the verse means, not only do, am I trying to do that with this one, but this one is actually used by the catechism. So we're actually using the church's interpretation via the catechism of what this means. That there is another age by which we can be forgiven. Either in this age or the age to come. Alright? And lastly, in Matthew 18, verses 32 to 35. Matthew 18, 32 to 35. And you guys might be familiar with this story. This is the story about the servant who comes to the king and then the king forgives him his debt but then he goes out and then he has people who owe him and he holds them to it and then the king comes back and this is what he says. <coughs> Verse 32 and following. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you besought me. And you should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. So if we take this verse and we cross-reference it with 1232 where we talk about the age to come. Where do you go to pay off your debt, even every last penny of your debt, in this age or the age to come? So there must be a place that this happens. This goes back to temporal punishment, 
with the understanding that even if he is forgiven, there's still satisfaction or something that is owed to be made up for the sin. And so, those are the principles that we have for that. So let's summarize this real quick. And I'll try to say it slowly so everyone can write it down. We'll do it in paragraph form. There is punishment for sins even after forgiveness. Cross-reference 2 Samuel 12. There is punishment for sins even after forgiveness. We need to be perfect as the Father is perfect so that we can be clean to enter heaven. Cross-reference Matthew 5, 48 and Revelation 21, 27. These are the verses we went through already. There is punishment for sins even after forgiveness. We need to be perfect as the Father is perfect so that we can be clean to enter heaven. We know that there is some way that the spirits of just men are made perfect. Hebrews 12. We know that there is a place besides heaven or hell that you can suffer loss but still be saved through fire. 1 Corinthians. We know there is a place besides heaven or hell that you can suffer loss but still be saved through fire. Where you can be forgiven of your sins from a previous age. Cross reference Matthew 12 in this age or the age to come. And where you will stay until you pay the last penny. Matthew 18. We also know one last thing. This is a principle I missed. In 2 Maccabees 12. You can write that down. In 2 Maccabees 12. We know that. We can pray for those going through this process. So let me read it straight through so, I, so it can sound like it is, like, like what it needs to sound like. So think about the question. Can you explain to me why you believe purgatory is offended by the scriptures? And this would be my response. Well, there is a punishment for sins even after forgiveness. As it says in 2 Samuel 12, 13 to 18, we need to be perfect as the Father is perfect so that we can be clean to enter heaven. Cross-reference Matthew 5, 48 and Revelation 21, 27. We know that there is some way that the spirits of just men are made perfect. Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. We know there is a place besides heaven or hell that you can suffer loss but still be saved through fire. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15. Where you can be forgiven of your sins of a previous age. In this age or the age to come. Matthew 12. And where you stay until you pay the last penny. Matthew 18. We also know that we can pray for those who are going through this process. 2 Maccabees. Doesn't that sound a lot like what we believe about purgatory? And it's all from the scriptures. Any questions? I know that's a lot, but I know you guys have been hungry for it. Because you've been asking for things like this. Instead of us just taking one verse and chatting about it for half an hour, then eating food and going home, you know. You guys asked for intensity. Here you go. Any questions, Chris? <clears throat> you want to join us? Yeah, grab a Bible. We have some food too. Eat up, guys, by the way. FYI, it's for you to eat. Okay, that's fine. 
Anybody else have questions? Okay. Well, I want to go a little bit deeper, though. So those are the verses that were kind of like the primary, on the base. If you guys were to be asked now, what's your biblical basis for purgatory, you can bring this to the forefront and explain it. Um, there's one question that kind of stuck, stuck out, though. And one verse. Um, is that? There's Matthew, uh, Matthew 12, 32. Another age where we can be forgiven. And um, for the sins, not for the sins of this age, but in another age we can be forgiven. Is that only for female sins or would that be for both? Because, you know, when they, we believe that um, when we commit a grave sin, we get hell, right? So your question is whether or not we can be forgiven of uh, if, venial if be a, a or mortal, mortal sin, sin in the age yeah. to come? Excellent question. And that's what we're going to go through when we go deeper to 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15. Because I believe 1 Corinthians 13 to 15 actually specifies three different people. Those who are righteous, who receive a reward. Those who suffer loss, but still are saved, venial sin. And then those who do not make it to heaven, mortal sin. And I think it's clarified here. But of course, the temporal punishment are those that are attached to venial sins. Because a mortal sin is wherein we tell God, through our actions, with full knowledge, full consent, and with grave matter, we cut ourselves off from God. Remember, a, venial, uh, a mortal sin is not where God cuts us off, but where we cut off from God, right? And that's important to know. And so, we are not forgiven of, if we die with a mortal sin, we go straight to hell. And again, don't let anyone fool you on that. Hell exists, and if we die in a state of mortal sin, even though God is the God of all, and I never judge anyone, and it's not that, well, I think you committed a mortal sin, therefore you must be going to hell. Just mortal sin in and of what it is, in and of itself, if you are in that state, properly understood, you've decided to go to hell. That's what a mortal sin is. Now, just to refresh, though, remember, a mortal sin, you need to have three things. It needs to be grave matter, it needs to be a serious deal. You're not going to go to hell for stealing a paperclip. Right? It needs to be a serious thing. You need to have full consent. You have to have full knowledge first. You have to know it's a serious sin. And then you have to have full consent. So for example, we would all agree that premarital sex outside of marriage is wrong. And you as Catholics, studied Catholics, know that it's wrong. So it's a grave thing and you know you have full knowledge. But in the situation where somebody is raped, is that person committing a grave thing? Yes. Did that person know it was a grave thing? Yes. But did they have consent? No. So in that situation, they're not culpable of a mortal sin. Right? So we have to understand that difference. And by the way, I, I'll answer your question, but I want to show you in Scripture where the difference between venial and mortal sin are explained, actually. It's very clear in the Bible. I'll show you in a second. You have a follow-up question? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, full consent. I just want to be sure I understand the question. Full consent, is that mean that um, like your intention of doing that sin was meant to hurt God? Because I guess that's what um, I was raised in. When I was raised in confirmation, that's what um, I've, been, I've been taught. Like, um, like the, in order for something to be a mortal sin to... It, uh, your intent would have to be to hurt God. Does that mean that it, it wouldn't then? Because you know how there's a difference between yeah. um, killing and um, murder. Yeah, so the question is, do you have to intend to hurt God for it to be a mortal sin? There's a couple ways I'm going to answer it. The first is to not answer it by saying that, you know, ultimately, just so you guys know, that God is the ultimate judge of that, not me or any, any formula. However, I'm going to warn against that kind of thinking. Because that kind of thinking goes into a false premise of conscious, of conscious thought, which I believe to be called the fundamental option theory. Right? This is a false moral principle. In fact, we went over that in, uh, on RC, in RCIA. The fundamental option theory. Well, I believe in God. And I love God. I've chosen God as my Savior. And I would never want to leave God. And though I committed this sin, 
though I am committing this grave, serious thing with full knowledge, I don't want to break off my relationship with God. And therefore, it's not a mortal sin. Right? That can be very dangerous. You know? And in fact, I would say that if you say that enough and loud enough, you basically make sin disappear. Because would you ever just be like, you know what, God, I am doing this to spite you. Right? No, very rarely would that happen. No, it could happen. But mortal sin is when you have full knowledge, full consent, and it's a great matter, period. Right? Now, this is really hard. It's really hard for us to deal with because there are many things, especially our teenagers. There's things that they know are grave, that they do, that they do with full consent. Uh, the, the, the primary one, even though it's uncomfortable in settings with young adults and youth to talk about it, is masturbation. Right? Well, you know, you didn't intend to hurt God, so don't worry about it. Well, no, see, that's the wrong way to approach it. You can't approach it like that. Now, what you can approach it is with pastoral guidance, understand that sometimes when someone's addicted to something, that it's mitigated, right? That if they're seeking to overcome it, that not each time you do it is it mortal, right? That's not up for me to decide. You go to a, con a pastor for that, and you go to a confessor, and you go through that process. But I wouldn't recommend teaching it as such, where, well, you didn't intend to hurt God, so don't worry about it, right? I would teach it, and as I have, this is a serious thing. Don't worry about it. It's something that happens to all men, most men anyway. And God has forgiveness for you. That's why He died on the cross. So I want you to you know, flee to Him. Let's go to confession and you can confess this and we're going to overcome this. And during confession, most often the priest will say, Listen, your body's going through a lot of changes right now. I know it's hard. We're going to try to stay pure. And we're going to keep praying. And every single time, he's going to give them advice of how to overcome it. Right? See, that is the pastoral proper way to overcome a serious sin. Not to condemn the person, but also not to make the sin disappear. Does that make sense? So there needs to be a balance. And, and again, I would recommend, if you have any more questions about that, that that's something that you need to bring to a priest, your confessor, a pastor, you know, to help you explain that process of pastorally guiding someone through serious sins like that. But I think that that's where your question was rooted, in things as such, where what, right, what, what happens in situations where it's an addiction, maybe. Well, in those situations, their um, pastors would tell you that, you know, in fact, there are uh, letters written to confessors that explain how to help people through that and that, you know, it's mitigated through addiction and that it might not be as serious each time it happens. But it's still a serious thing that needs to be overcome, right? Um, those are things which I'm not too well versed in and, you know, you might want to ask a, a, a priest about that, um, that process. By the way, just want to throw it out there. First John, chapter five. First John, chapter five, verses sixteen through seventeen. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God will give him life. For those whose sin is not mortal, there is a sin which is mortal. I do not say that one is to pray for that. All ruin, all wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin which is not mortal. Right? So the, write, the writer of this letter is saying that there's two kinds of sin. Mortal sin, and then sin that's not mortal. That's where the church gets its understanding of mor venial versus mortal sin. Yeah? And back to your first question though, yes, it's during the process of purgatory where we are being purified of the temporal punishments that have come as a result of our venial sins. Right? Or possibly even mortal sins too, which we've been forgiven of though. Not that we died on it, that we're forgiven, you know, but that we, are, uh, that, we, that we have temporal punishment still attached to. All right? Any other questions? Welcome, by the way. She's just like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> We're talking about purgatory today, and where that's found in the Bible. So, Tifa can give you some of the uh, scripture that we read. We read a whole bunch. So I don't want to go too much longer, maybe another 10 minutes or so. But I do want to kind of run through. I have tons of notes that I took. There are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of verses that support the Catholic's belief 
Catholic Church's teaching on purgatory. But I want to kind of go through just a couple that make it very, very clear. Um, first of all, I want to answer a common issue. When we bring this up to uh, Protestants or even Catholics who have grown up in this modern age, they are overwhelmingly <clears throat> tainted. I, I'm going to say the word tainted. Maybe, maybe that's not the best word. But they are overwhelmingly affected by the Protestant, non-denominational, evangelical mind frame or mindset. So even Catholics sometimes think a lot like Protestants because that's what we're surrounded by. Right? Everything needs to be found in the Bible. Right? We almost kind of think that that's what we have to do even though we don't. But it's because we're constantly surrounded by those who believe that. Also, another prevalent thing, this is a huge one, is that there's only heaven and hell and there's nothing else. So when you say purgatory, they're like, what are you talking about? There's either heaven or... That is so wacky, because there's only heaven or hell. <laughs> you guys are weird. Well, that's kind of the first thing that we have to overcome. It's a psychological thing. And... I think there's a very effective way to help people overcome it. In other words, this is the primer. I would almost use this before even going through the other scriptures. And I'm going to give you two here. Three, actually. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 19. Luke 23. 39 through 43. Then Luke 16, 19 through 28. Let's take a look at Luke 23 first. Luke 23, and I'll wait till everyone turns there. I think this is a really good verse for us to kind of reflect on. Luke 23. 39 through 43. This is the crucifixion, right? This is when Christ is on the cross, he's being crucified. And then what happens here? <coughs> Again, I usually, of course, have you guys read it out loud, but I kind of want to record it, so I'll just. Can I read it right now? One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him. Sorry. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do not fear God. You, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly for our receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingly power. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, as a side, I just noticed something. Uh, they call him the good thief, right, on the cross. Interesting how he's seeking forgiveness, but at the same time that he's seeking God's forgiveness, he's saying that truly, it says, we indeed justly are receiving the due reward for our deeds. It's temporal punishment, isn't it? That's interesting. I just noticed that as a sign. That he's, he's basically testifying to the fact that even with forgiveness, we, you have to pay the price for what you've done. You have to pay the, the temporal punishment or what's owed as a result of the sin. But that's not the main point. The main part is this. Jesus says to the good thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now the whole point of me bringing this up is to bring up these three verses and this one specifically is to help people who are just so closed off that mindset of there's heaven, hell and anything else is just kind of weird to believe. The reason why I bring this up is it's very clear and it's very easy with this verse to show that there, didn't, there does indeed exist or at least existed places besides heaven and hell that were not of this world. Because... Paradise refers to, and we're going to cross-reference it to uh, Luke 16, and then also 1 Peter 3 in a second, the other verses I gave you. Paradise refers to 
what's also known as uh, bosoms, uh, Abraham's bosom. That's what we see in, uh, we don't have to actually read it, we can just uh, tell you, that's what we find in Luke 16, 19 to 28. It's Abraham's bosom. Um, in 1 Peter three nineteen, it's called prison. We'll go to that one in a second. But in the Old Testament, it was referred to as Sheol. All right? So paradise equals Sheol equals Abraham's bosom equals prison. I'll read 1 Peter real quickly for you so that you guys can just hear it. You guys can write it down and uh, join me if you guys can get there quick. And it just says that Christ, speaking of Christ, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, we know that prison is not hell because there's no point in Jesus going to prison, to hell to preach, because they cannot be saved. And prison is not in heaven, so it's another place. It's some place else. And in the Old Testament, it was called Sheol. And guess what? Sheol also in the Old Testament was called Hades, called hell. That's why in the Apostles' Creed, we say that he descended into hell. It's referring to 1 Peter 3. He descended into prison. The hell there, that's why some people don't say hell, what do they say? They say, descended into the dead, right? And that's because people misunderstood what the church was trying to say by the word hell there. Hell is not referring to the hell of damnation when we talk about that in the um, creed. It's not the place where Satan is, where you're damned forever. Hell in the creed is the Old Testament understanding of Hades, Sheol, prison, paradise, Abraham's bosom. In the Old Testament, they believe that when you died, you went to, just imagine a great big box. And we'll call it Sheol, right? This is where you go. Everybody goes to Sheol after they die. And then there's different compartments. There's a little compartment in the side, or maybe it's big, I don't know, where that's where you're damned. That's where Satan is. You're damned. Conde condemnation. But then you also have other parts of Sheol, Hades, Hell, that are for the righteous, who are waiting for Christ the Messiah to come so that the gates of heaven could be opened. Remember the patriarchs, Abraham, Noah, they didn't go to heaven right away because the gates weren't open yet. Heaven wasn't open yet, right? And so, even though I'm going into a deeper theology of the fact that we have to understand what hell was in the Old Testament, needless to say that there was a waiting place. In Luke 16, it's Abraham's bosom, where the righteous would go to wait until the gates of heaven were open. Everyone following me so far? Paradise was also another word for that. And so when Christ goes into prison, as it says in 1 Peter 3, He's not going into the hell of damnation. He's going into the prison. Abraham's bosom. Paradise. Where the righteous are waiting for the gates of heaven to be opened. Because remember, when Christ died, this is why that verse in Luke 23 is so important. When Christ died, the gates of heaven didn't open right away. When, the gate, when did the gates of heaven open? when he rose from the dead, right? So he defeated death and the gates of heaven were open when he rose from the dead. So there's three days there. But if he's telling the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise, is he lying? No. It's because today he will be with him in the place of the righteous, Abraham's bosom, Sheol. right? Sheol, right? The place where they're waiting. And he'll go and preach to them and then when he rises, the gates of heaven will be open. He's going down to prison, they'll be like, yo, I died for your sin. I died to redeem mankind. And when I rise, you're going to heaven, baby. Right? That was the good news he went to preach. In, to those in prison. Paradise. Sheol. Hades. Abraham's bosom. That alone. That alone. Those three verses show and should be able to any studied Christian would agree then. There's no, there's no doubt about this teaching. They believe it too. If they understand it or studied. Their pastors would believe that yes, you've just proven or you've just shown that there is indeed a place besides heaven and hell. Whether that place exists anymore, whether there was only a temporary place, the fact is, is we can start to transform people's minds to understanding that there can be another place besides heaven and hell. Also, even though the scripture is kind of skipping me from uh, skipping my mind right now, I also know that in Revelation it talks about the angels in heaven, where Satan battles Saint Michael, right? And it was called the time of perdition, where they battled. And it says a third of the stars in heaven fell. Well, once you're in the beatific vision, once you behold God's full glory, you cannot fall from that beatific vision. You cannot sin once you experience the beatific vision. It's done. 
And so we know that the angels could not have been in heaven where God is. Because no angel can fall once they have the beatific vision. So the early church fathers called it the time of perdition. This is where the angels, because they had a free will as well, where they had to choose to either follow God or to not. Because they had a free will. Now their free will was perfected, not like ours. Uh, their, their intellect, their, their being is so great that they decided one time. Right? We need to decide every day we wake up. Or even every minute of the day we have to decide to choose Christ. Right? But they chose once. But this time of perdition where they decided, it says that it took place in the heavens. Plural. And we know it's not heaven where God is because if any angel or any man beholds a beatific vision, they can never fall away. So then, again, another scriptural place where we can see that there is another place besides heaven where God is and, and hell where Satan is that exists. Everyone following so far? So those passages are really important because it helps us understand that there is a place besides that. And it helps primer going into those other verses I gave you later or earlier today to explain purgatory. All right, so again, this is the going deeper part. I'm not, I'm not building on what we already did. I'm giving things to help prepare you or to defend even further. <clears throat> Last thing I want to do. And then I'll, I'll share some other verses. Oh, there's a few more things, I guess. Let me give you some of the easier verses to not have to explain in depth, but that you guys can uh, look up on your own. Let me give you a few more. Philippians 2, verse 10. You don't have to turn to it right now. But basically, that's where he says that every knee shall bow, in every knee on earth, in heaven, and under the earth. Right? Well, under the earth, uh, some, some scripture scholars believe that under the earth is the idiom that refers to purgatory. So, every knee on earth and under the earth shall bow to God. The understanding there. Now, a lot of these things, this is not the church saying this is what it means. This is smart theological um, exegesis, right? Um, assumption, if you will. But it's, it's educated. It's not just saying it. This one's powerful too. I'll give you two more that are really powerful. Number one of these two is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. Because everyone says, well, you know, some, some, by the way, Protestants do not accept 2 Maccabees as a book of the Bible. That's another topic. We'll cover another day. But they don't accept 2 Maccabees as a book of the Bible. So when it says in chapter 12, verse 46, that they prayed for the dead, they're like, yeah, you know what? It does say that they prayed for the dead, but guess what? We don't believe in that book. So you can't use it. Well, at first that seems like a stumbling block. Well, how do you prove that we should pray for the dead? Because if you can pray for the dead... Then we just use the syllogism, well, you, can't, you don't have to pray for those who are in heaven. You can't pray for those who are in hell, so it's something with somebody else, right? So some would say 2 Maccabees 12 is enough for you to explain purgatory. There's another place that we have to pray for them. It's not heaven, it's not hell, where is it? But since they don't accept that book, it would be very helpful to find a place in the New Testament, wouldn't it? Where someone's praying for the dead. And guess who does? Paul does. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. And let's read that real quick. I'll read it out loud. All right. It says here, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me eagerly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you will know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So we have an example. Paul knows that this person is dead. And he is saying, may the Lord grant him to find mercy on, from him on that day. So he's praying. He's at may the Lord. He's praying for this person that he knows who has died. Right? So we have an example there of somebody who has died who Paul is praying for. Why pray for him? If he's in heaven, he doesn't need the prayers. If he's in hell, there's no chance for him. It's because there's another place besides heaven and hell. And I think Paul makes it clear. So let's finish off by going through 1 Corinthians 3, which I believe is the clearest example. And you can turn to that one too. 
1 Corinthians 3, and we're going to go through verses 10 through 17. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. That's the, the one that suffer loss, though we'll be saved, as through fire. I'm going to go through that one a little bit. And um, we also have, by the way, guys, Joseph arrived. Uh, this is Joseph Landry. Joe and I actually went to college together, so Joe has his advanced degrees in theology as well, and um, quite frankly, is smarter than me when it comes to a lot of this stuff, so maybe he can give us some insight too. Can we hang up that phone and make sure that we don't get bothered anymore? We can just unplug, unplug the uh, bottom part. Because if we don't unplug it, it's just going to keep ringing, right? What's that? Oh, there it is. Excellent. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians 3 then. And uh, let's go through it. Let's read from verses 10, from verse 10. And let's go all the way uh, till verse 17. All right. According to the commission of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he built upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that temple you are. So I want to point out a couple of things here. I wrote some notes here. Um, let me just read my notes, and so that we can go from there. So 1 Corinthians 10-15, through 15, those first five verses, Works are judged after death and tested by fire. Some works are lost, but the person is still saved. And so right here we're talking about a state of purgation. Now I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a claim here. Again, this is my, my reading, my rendering of the scripture here. I believe a couple of things. First of all, if you look at verse, let's take a look here. Verse 12. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Those are all, there's a, there's a big contrast between gold, silver, and precious stones, and then wood, hay, and stubble, right? I believe he's basically enumerating the kinds of works. He's basically giving them, like, there's these kinds of works. There's gold, silver, precious stones, and then there's wood, hay, and stubble. And those that can withstand the fire, what does it say here? It says, if the work that any man has built in the foundation survives when it's tested by fire, he will receive a reward, verse 14. So I believe that refers to those who are in a state of righteousness. I think that if you look at it, is it possible to die in a state of righteousness and go straight to heaven? The church says, yes, it is possible. Very rare, but it is possible. How do we know that? Because um, the church has made exceptions for martyrs. We also know from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, that when we suffer here on earth, we start working on our purification of our soul here. So is it possible to die in, that state of, you know, in a perfect state of grace or with enough charity in our hearts so as to not go through that? Yes, um, it is possible. And I believe that verse 14 here is talking about the state of righteousness. So those in that state, or the works that we receive that are in that state, receive a reward. However, then it says in verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, now I, I'm assuming he's talking about the wood, hay, and stubble, right? If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. Again, remember I asked the question, where can you, after death, remember in verse 13 when it says that day, that day is referring to the last day. It's referring to uh, the end of time, the, the, the final judgment. And um, in, that, in that sense, we know this is after death. Where after death can you go, suffer loss, and still be saved? You can't suffer loss in heaven, can't do it in hell. St. Paul is talking about a state of purgation. 
But you asked a question about venial and mortal sin. I believe verse uh, 15 there is talking about those who are in a state of venial sin, who have been forgiven of their mortal sin, who have died with temporal punishment um, due as a result of their venial sin, or even sins they've been forgiven for, and that they go through uh, a purgation for it. Right? And then, verse 16 and 7, actually verse 17 specifically, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that temple you are. I think, even though this is my rendering of it, I think it's very clear in, in my perspective that he's talking about the last state, which is mortal sin, which is you are destroyed. He, you don't get purified by the, by the fire of purgatory if you die in a state of mortal sin. You don't go to purgatory if you die in a state of mortal sin. You go to hell. So I believe verse 14 is those in a state of righteousness. Verse 15 are those with venial sins who are being purged of the temporal punishment still owed on that sin. And then also uh, verse 17 are what happens to those who die in a state of mortal sin. Anything to add, Mr. Landry? Nothing. I don't know where you guys were before. Purgatory. So that's what we have there. Well, um, but, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, indulgences, uh, indulgences are an integral link to purgatory. Can you talk about indulgences? No, I was going to say that from the day, but go for it. Well, I don't know. Do you know that? Yeah, okay. Well, um, I'll give you a couple of verses that you guys can read. I don't want to throw you guys way off, but there are a couple of things that <clears throat> say that we can actually... Um, we can actually do things to not only purify ourselves. So we already got one. First Peter four, First Peter four one. Where um, let me read that again. And when he's talking about indulgences, he's talking about things, works, uh, acts that can be done in order to uh, satisfy those temporal punishments. That's what an indulgence is. Are specific things that we can do that actually um, go towards paying back what's owed for the temporal punishment that we have. In other words, it would be like us being grounded for crashing the car, even though we're forgiven, we're grounded, and it would be like you raking the yard, right? You have to rake the yard, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do that in order for, your ground, your, for you not to be grounded anymore, and then you go and rake the yard. You're working towards making up for that temporal punishment. Mom's already forgiven you, but you're still grounded, and now you have to try to do something to make up for it, right? So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, we see... Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same thought, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So we know that suffering can act as a way to purify the soul, right? Another really powerful one that uh, a lot of people that do not believe in purgatory or who do not believe in the Catholic Church have a really hard time explaining is Col uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. St. Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. Now, how dare Paul say that Christ's death on the cross wasn't perfect, that it's lacking anything? Well, of course he's not saying that. Christ's once-for-all sacrifice on the cross is what gives us the chance to go to heaven, period. Without him dying on the cross, there's no heaven for us. But what St. Paul is saying is that there are things, temporal punishments, that we do need to um, amend for ourselves, that we have to go through in order to make up for these sins. And that's why, of course, um, all of this flies in the face. This whole, everything I gave you, of course, flies in the face of the idea of solo fide, of faith alone. Because it's not that. There's no once saved, always saved anywhere in the scripture. We, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, work out our salvation in fear and trembling every single day. And we have, if we choose to, we can fall away from God's grace. We can lose the salvation that God has granted us. And, you know, one of the things that I like is to, to point to here. I might be going off track here, but there it is. Is in um, Peter. Second uh, Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty and following. 
Very clear. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog turns back to his own vomit and the sow washed only to wallow in the mire. Very clear that you can have God's righteousness and that you can turn away from it and reject it. Right? Yes, it does say in Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through 10, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Amen. does not say anywhere in that verse that we can choose to no longer be in Christ Jesus, because we can. And we can choose to no longer be in Him, because He is a gentleman, He is a loving God, who has not taken away our free will. And we can choose to reject Him whenever we will please. Right? And so, because of that, we do need to make up for our sins, those temporal punishments. And as we heard in Matthew 5.48, if we're not going to do it in this age, it will happen in the age to come. On that day, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, where our works will be tested as true fire, and that for those of us who have temporal punishments still remaining from the sin that we've committed, we will suffer loss, be punished, but we'll still be saved. That is purgatory. Amen? All right. Okay, well, I'm going to end the recording. <laughs> you know what's really funny here is...